Good evening. Welcome to our evening class. Uh, we're continuing with our study of this book, The Christ of the Covenant, written by O. Palmer Robertson, one of the founding fathers of the PCA. And so uh, we are in lesson or class number three. So hopefully you have with you two sheets of paper. The first one is obviously the lesson for tonight, and the next one is the syllabus. So you can follow along what we will be covering. So we're in class three, okay? So we are today, tonight, discussing the diversity in the divine covenants, okay? So remember the first two classes, we, we learned what is the concept or the meaning of what is a covenant, right? A mutual agreement, right? In biblical terms, right? Remember, it was made by the, the greater uh, being, in this case God, with the lesser being, in this, in this case man, right? So God is the one taking the initiative and the terms. He's setting up the terms and the conditions of the covenant. So, so God is the one initiating, okay? All these terms and conditions, blessing and curses, right? And so we, we learned that in the, in the first class. Hopefully you remember that, right? And so we also learn about the nature of the divine covenant. You know, what, what, what is it, right? What, what, what is the implications? Remember, there was the blood component. You know, blood, it was necessary in order to pay um, the consequences of breaking the covenant, right? We saw that. Then last class, we talk about the extent and unity of the divine covenants, right? Uh, so what did we learn by that? What does that mean, the extent of the covenant, Right? So it was not just one covenant, for example, with Abraham, and that was it. You know, that was the, by the time that Moses shows up, it does, didn't mean that the Abrahamic covenant was already gone. Or that's in, it's, you know, it's invalidated. It's, it's not valid anymore. No, they built one upon each other. Right? And we saw that in Exodus, because whenever God talks to Moses, remember, uh, he reminds him about the covenant that he made with Abraham. So there is an extension, right, of the Abrahamic covenant. You know, different um, components, different signs, right, in each covenant. You have to remember that. It's not all the same, right? So there's an extent. Yes, we have this covenant, but it's going to build on, you know, the, the Abrahamic covenant, for example. You know, we have that, and then we have the Mosaic covenant that's going to build on the Abrahamic covenant. But then there's other, other components, like, for example, what was the, 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 the component that we didn't see in the Abrahamic covenant that we see in the Mosaic covenant? It was different sites, right? Locations, but what else? What, what, what elements do we see now in the, the law, right? The written law of God, you see? Um, it's not that God, again, God did not get rid of the first covenant with Abraham, Okay. And even we, we can even go back and re remember the covenant that, you know, God made with Noah, right? And uh, one of our ruling elders will be talking about that in two weeks, about the Noahic covenant, or in three weeks, I guess. So all, you know, more in detail. So, and there is unity, right? What, what is the, about the unity? How, is this, how are these covenants united? What unites them? God, yes, true, is the same um, uh, actor, right, God. But what about the other actor? Is it the same people or different people? Different, same? Different, gener yeah, you can say different generations, but it's still, it's one people of God, right? It's not two people of God, right? Yes, it's different generations, right? It is not, you know, the, the people, you know, Abraham, you know, it's not longer, during the, you know, uh, Moses' time. He's already gone, right? But still is under the one people deal, one people covenant, you know. Because God told Abraham, I will make out of you, you know, look at the, the, look at the sky, look at the, the stars. You know, that's going to be your people, your descendants, right? So it's talking about the people, the one people of God. And then God chooses Israel, to be this special nation from all the countries in the world. You know, in Deuteronomy 7, I believe, talks about, you know, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest. I chose you because you were the, the smallest, the most insignificant nation in the world. But I love you. 
And I want you to be my people, to be a vehicle of salvation to the rest of the world. Okay? It, does, it didn't mean that you have to be Jew by birth in order to be saved. You know, God never says that. Okay? But God uses Israel to be a vehicle of salvation to the world. Right? To to conquer all the other nations, to teach them God's way, God's law, okay? It was never meant, just salvation was never meant to be only for the Jewish. Was that? That's right, correct, yeah. Yeah, so the, there was this this tension with other religions right back in in those days in the world but again you know god you chose israel to be a vehicle of salvation to all nations god did not want to keep he did not want to keep salvation from the foreigner but god wants israel to show the salvation god willing that by the, when the foreigner saw, you know, when I say foreigner or uh, sojourner, I'm, I mean like a, a non-Jewish by birth or a person who, from another country back then, you know, whenever they saw Israel following one God, not different gods, little g, gods, but capital G, the one God of Israel, when they saw their devotion to God, to the one God, when they saw uh, how God uh, fed them, you know, in Egypt, how in the desert, how he took care of them, you know, the world was witnessing all that. You know, who is this God who sent 10 plagues to, to deliver these people? Who is this God? And Israel had the, the doors open for, for them to share about this one God who demands fidelity from his people. You know, God is a very exclusive God when it comes to his worship. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want any competition. Because that's called idolatry. If, you, if there is something in your life that is competing with, with God in your life, you know, that's an idol. And we have to acknowledge that. And sometimes, you know, we can cover our eyes to that. And that can be a problem, you know. And sometimes God uses situations in our lives to show us, to point us, that is an idol in your life. And you need to repent from that. You need to walk away from that. Right? So, God demands exclusive veneration, worship of Him only. He doesn't want any competition. Okay? When it comes to His, own, to, to his worship. And so we learned that, you know, the, about the unity of the covenant is the same people, one people of God, one God, you know, um, teaching them how to how to to do how to work in the world how to act with one another right we see that in the 10 commandments the first four commandments talk about the relationship between the people of God and God the fourth first right but after that 5th 6 7 8 and 9 10 talks about my relationship with my neighbor so God is concerned not just in the, the, the vertical relationship, okay, me and God. He's concerned about how you treat one another. The horizontal relationship, okay? And that matters to God. You know, sometimes we think that God only is concerned about my relationship between me and Him. And yes, you know, you, you cannot, you know, when you make a profession of faith, you know, you're not saving you know, you know, your neighbor with you when you make that profession of faith. You know, your neighbor has to make their own profession of faith, right? Because you have to deal with your own sins, right? But he's concerned in how you treat your neighbor. How, how do you um, live with your neighbor? You know, it's a grievous, you know, there is this, um, there is this uh, commandment in the Bible, you know, it's the, the, eighth, the Eighth Commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Right? He's talking about my relationship with my neighbor's, you know, spouse. You know, so God is concerned about that. As well. Or you shall not steal. You know? 
So, you know, that matters to God, okay? Okay, so tonight's lesson is going to be on the diversity in the divine covenants. So if you have your book with you, that is in page number 53, okay? So, um, O. Palmer Robertson uh, divides this, this first, uh, you know, the, the, this chapter, the first pages, into these three structural dis distinctions, okay? So, yes, there is diversity. There is not just, these covenants are not just unified because it's God, the main actor, obviously, you know, and then the, the one people of God. But now, this, each covenant is, is diverse. They have their own thing, their own... Um, uh, qualities, right? So, for example, the first, you know, the structural basic distinctions of this, the, in, when talking about diversity, is the number one, is pre-creation and post-creation covenants, okay? So, there is a covenant, a pre-creation covenant. This is before God created the earth, you know, everything that we see. There's this covenant, this or also called uh, the eternal covenant, okay, between the, the Trinity, Okay, and so we'll, I will show you a video you know, to, to explain what it means, what is, what is that called. So you can say, so hopefully you have the study guide with you in front. So you can put under number one, so there is a space, you have a space actually in the study guide to, to take notes there. So the pre-creation covenant is basically the covenant of redemption, okay, or other people call it the, the eternal covenant, okay. This is a pre-creation Recreation covenant is called the covenant of redemption or the eternal covenant, okay? And so what happens here is that, you know, the, the, the father and the son, you know, they, 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 they come to this agreement in which God, the father, chooses a people to, them, to himself and then the son executes this plan, okay? So... So how does the Trinity work? You know, you can, we will talk more in depth about this, but th th this might help you, okay, un understand this. So, um, so the Father, you know, so the, what's the Trinity? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. So the Father, he's the one who originates. He's the one who plans, okay? He's the one who plans. The Son is the one who executes, this plan or the one who who purchased when he's talking about soteriology salvation he's the one who purchases you and me for salvation okay he purchased us on the cross okay so you can say the father you know plans the son executes and the holy spirit does what applies okay applies the salvation on us once when we believe. So, the, you know, there's the, the believing factor, the faith factor. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes to see our need of a Savior. Okay? So you see how they work together, right? And so let me show you a video um, by R.C. Sproul. It's very interesting. He talks about the covenant of redemption. He really explained it really, really well. Um, even though for O. Palmer Robertson, you know, he it seems that he's not really, he, it seems that he doesn't really want to call this a covenant of redemption because there is not really components of a covenant when it comes to the Trinitarian, you know, uh, dealing with one another pre-creation. But still he mentioned it. And many theologians call this obviously the covenant of redemption. There is this covenant that God, you know, um, originates, God the Father, God the Son executes this plan, and then the Trinity applies the salvation to believers. So let me let me let me show this video by R.C. Sproul of the Bible. Now, sometimes uh, historic reform theology is nicknamed covenant theology. I've never really uh, appreciated that distinction too much because I believe that that all branches of theology recognize to some degree the importance of covenants in uh, understanding uh, biblical redemption. Now, to be sure, there's a certain focus on covenant that you find within Reformed theology, but uh, we're not going to be just simply developing Reformed theology in this course as so much as looking actually at the 
content of the biblical covenants as they occur to us. I think it's very important for us to understand at the outset that the whole concept of covenant is integral, it's foundational, it's basic to the whole scope of divine revelation. We could even say, for example, that the way that God reveals His Word and His plan biblically is through the structure of various covenants. And yet at the same time, as as frequently as the Bible speaks about covenants, there's a lot of confusion, I'm afraid, that attends the very meaning of the term covenant. For example, we frequently speak about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and then we speak of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the tendency is to use those terms interchangeably, that is, to consider the Old Testament as a synonym for the Old Covenant and the New Testament as a synonym for the New Covenant. Well, of course, those terms are closely related, but they really aren't synonyms. They don't mean exactly the same thing, and I'm hoping that in the process of this uh, course we'll begin to see uh, uh, the distinctions between these two and how they impact our understanding of Scripture. Now, let me just say again that the biblical revelation that we encounter in Scripture is progressive. That is, there is a gradual unfolding of God's uh, revelation. He doesn't give it all to us in the book of Genesis. But as history moves uh, through time, God gives more and more and more revelation of Himself and of His plan of redemption. Now, that continuing progressive revelation is not corrective. It's not like the newest revelation corrects the old one because God doesn't need to be corrected, but he, he augments or adds additional content to that revelation as time passes. And again, the basic structure that carries that progression is the structure of covenant. Now, the first question that we ask about covenants is, uh, what are they? What is a covenant? And again, there is a little bit of confusion there. We understand that a covenant involves some kind of agreement. And just in church this past week, I was talking to our congregation about the way in which covenants are foundational to our very culture and to our very lives. For example, we are a republic by way of the political structure and foundation of the United States, and the theory, the political theory that was implemented in the grand experiment in the New World uh, relied heavily on John Locke's political philosophy where he developed what was then called the social contract Uh, nature of government. Uh, Rousseau also had developed uh, ideas along this line, and the concept there was that there was a relationship between the rulers and those who were ruled, between the government and the people, whereby the governors were selected or elected by the people and only were empowered to rule by the consent of the people. And so there was an agreement, a mutual pledge of fidelity between the people who pledged their allegiance to their government and the government uh, officials who took their oaths of office to uphold the Constitution and so on. And so there was a contract or a pact, an agreement, binding these two sides to each other. In addition to that, we see commonly in our society the, uh, what we call the industrial contract, which comes in many forms. When people go to work for a company, they may sign a contract where the employer promises them certain remuneration and benefits and so on, where the employee in turn uh, promises to give so much of their their time uh, in working for the company. We call that an industrial contract. You see it in labor agreements all the time with unions and so on. But also, on a, on a more popular level, every time uh, we buy something with a credit card 
or uh, on installment, we enter into a contract or an agreement to pay the full amount of the merchandise, which we may not pay in advance. We may pay over time. And when we do that, that's a commercial agreement, a commercial contract, where both parties are bound to uh, deliver on their promises. And of course, uh, most significant, we see it in the marriage contract, where the marriage contract is an agreement or, uh, that involves oaths and vows, sanctions, and promises uh, between two people. Now, all of these different uh, covenants that I've just mentioned in our culture have elements of similarity to the biblical covenants, but they're not identical. Though the biblical covenants have, indeed, elements of promise, one thing makes them different from these other normal customary agreements that we're talking about, and that is that biblical covenants are established on the basis of a divine sanction. That is, they are established on the foundation of a promise not made by equal parties, but they're made on the foundation of the divine promise of God, and they are inherently religious. Now, people might argue, well, marriage covenants are also religious. They, you know, their they, vows are taken before God, and that's true. But there's also some even people say that the covenant of, of industry, industrial contracts, are also religious insofar as the vows are taken, so help us God and, and all the rest. And there are religious elements that you can find in these various, or religious implications found in these various other covenants, but they don't have the same profound import of, of theological sanction that we find in the covenants of the Bible. Now, again, the key function in terms of redemption and redemption history of a covenant in the Bible is the relationship between promise and fulfillment. When I say that the basic structure of redemptive history that we see in the Scriptures is covenant, what I'm simply saying is that we exist as a church, we exist as people because God has made promises to His people, and He has kept those promises. He has fulfilled those promises. And that we only can exist in the family of God and in the church because our God is a God who keeps covenant. Our God is a God who is a covenant keeper where we are all covenant breakers. God never breaks His promise. Okay, I'm going to pause this for a moment. So he basically is giving an introduction about what is a covenant, how God doesn't break his covenant with his people, you know, how, has been, how God has been relating to people throughout history by covenants. That's basically what Dr. O. Palmer or Robertson is basically said in the first chapters of his book. But now, let's talk about this covenant of redemption. It was just a little introduction. Go here. It comes here. Let's see. Breaks his promises to us. And that's why, in one sense, nothing would be more foolish than not to trust in the promises of God, because God has demonstrated himself throughout history to be supremely trustworthy. Well, let's start now and ask ourselves where the first covenant uh, takes place. The and this involves some inferences drawn from the Scripture, on particularly drawn from the New Testament with respect to our understanding of the mission and the purpose and work of Jesus. Uh, lately, in fact, in this whole past year, I've been preaching out of the Gospel according to St. John to our congregation at St. Andrews in Orlando, and uh, so much of that, uh, of that book or that Gospel gives us the record of the controversies that Jesus had with the Jewish authorities of his day. And so much of that debate between Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the, or the uh, scribes and so on had to do with the origin of Jesus. 
and the basis of his authority. And again and again and again, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying that he was sent from the Father, that he was the supreme missionary of God. A missionary is someone who is sent and authorized by the one who sends them, or the group that sends them. And so Christ it constantly refers back to his origin, not as a baby born in Bethlehem, but as the one who came down from heaven, who was sent by the Father, and authorized by the Father to speak with the, to speak the Father's word. Now, if we look at that, then you, you understand something of what went on before God even created the world, before God ever created Adam and Eve, before there was a, any kind of probation in uh, the Garden of Eden. And we talk about first, in the first instance, not about a covenant that God makes with us, but a covenant that takes place within the triune Godhead itself. And this we call, in theological parlance, the covenant of redemption. Now, one of the things that's so important about this is that it speaks to us about the agreement that has existed from all eternity among the persons of the Godhead about God's plan of redemption. I remember when I was in graduate school in the 60s and there was a controversy brewing among German theologians on the continent that I, if I recall it, was called something like the Umstimmung uh, controversy, which there were those theologians who were arguing that the ministry of Jesus was uh, impelled by Jesus' desire to overcome the vengeful, wrathful inclinations of the Old Testament God. Going back to the heresy of Marcion in the early church, who expunged all references in the New Testament that would make the Old Testament God the father of Jesus because he thought that there was a basic incompatibility between Christ and the God of the Old Testament. You still see people like that all over the place who uh, say, well, I like the Jesus in the New Testament. It's that Old Testament God I can't stomach. He's such a vengeful God, and, and so on. And so this, this idea that arose in German theology was the idea that Christ came, really, he was trying to change God's mind, to relent from his purpose and plan to judge people and expose them to his wrath, and that basically the uh, the salvific work of Christ had to do with the Son's persuading the Father to ease up, as it were. And so that Christ reveals to us mercy, where the Father was all judgment. Well, I can't think of anything that is more distorting of the biblical portrait of both God the Father and God the Son than that kind of understanding. And so the principle that we're talking about here of the covenant of redemption is that the plan of salvation is conceived in the Godhead. And in a sense, we can say it's the Father's plan. It's the Father who sends the Son into the world. It's not that the Son comes on his own initiative. In fact, Jesus said, I do nothing on my own authority, but only that which the Father sends me to do. And so we see the Son coming from heaven to do the will of the Father in this world because the two of them, from all eternity, God the Father and God the Son, are in perfect agreement about the mission that the Son will fulfill in this world. That the Father and the Son are one in their eternal purpose. And you could add to that also the Holy Spirit, who is also in complete agreement with the Father and the Son in God's plan of redemption. So we have to talk about this prior covenant that takes place within the persons, within the Godhead, among the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And so we often will say that in the economy of redemption, it's the Father who sends the Son into the world to redeem uh, His people. It is the Son who accomplishes that redemption by His work of obedience. And it is the Holy Spirit, then, who applies the work of Christ to the people. It's the Spirit who illumines the Word of God for us. It's the Spirit who regenerates us in our souls. It's the Spirit who brings us to the Son who reconciles us to the Father. So that redemption, biblically, and we have to understand this from beginning to end, is a Trinitarian work. What do you think? Questions, comments of what R.C. Sproul just said? So we are, you know, in question number one, it was like, what is the pre pre-creation covenant? And the answer is, is the covenant of redemption. You know, it's a Trinitarian covenant. That makes, it makes sense, right? So, um, yeah, so, the, you know, the, the beautiful thing is that the Trinity, the Godhead, does not, they do not operate on their own. Meaning, you know, I have my own thing, and then he does his own thing. No, they all work in harmony. And that's beautiful to see, you know. And um, so, yeah, so that's the pre-creation covenant, the covenant of redemption, okay. And one thing that Arceus Pro was really hammering was that, you know, God does not break his covenant. He does not break his promises. You know, when we hear bad news, when you receive bad news, you know, the first instinct is, oh, my gosh. Oh my goodness, what's next? What am I going to do? You know, you start thinking about solutions. And people react differently, right? Some people just freeze. Some people just, like, okay, I have to think about a solution. Regardless of, of how you react to bad news, okay? One thing that you have to always remember is that nothing escapes from the plan of God. Amen? Nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to caught, caught, you know, catch God by surprise. Nothing. Okay? So the beautiful thing is that you are in Christ Jesus. You are part of his plan of redemption. Your name is already written in the book of the Lord. What, a, what an assurance. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. You know, you know, we, yes, sir. Very good. You know, so yeah, that book was already written. God already obviously knew who are going to be saved, you know, elected for salvation, you know. So, Christ did not die for everybody. He died for his people. Okay? I mean, salvation was offered to the world, right? To the whole world. But Christ did not die for... Christ died only for his people, for his elect. For the people, that, the one people that the Bible keeps talking about. My people. My children. Not everybody is a child of God. Only those who believe in Christ Jesus are called, can be called children of God. And therefore, heirs of His riches and glory. Isn't that wonderful? That glory awaits for you? That we are at the very end. We are actually at the very end of the story of redemption. What just needs to happen is that, that the Lord returns. That is the last part of the puzzle or the, 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 the last uh, component that is missing is his return. All the revelation of God has been given to us and it's in the Bible, in the 66 books that we see in the Bible. All you need to know about God, all you need to know about sin, all you need to know about myself, it's in the Bible. There is no other, I don't need to know another revelation because everything is in the written Finish word of God. And so, 
something to think about, right? Next time we hear bad news, God has planned already my circumstances and my life is secure in his hands no matter what happens tomorrow he will be faithful to his bride the church amen is the church going to disappear in america it's a it's a broad question right maybe i tell you this i don't know what's going to happen tomorrow but what I know for sure is that the Lord will never abandon his church, his bride, because he's a faithful husband. Let me say that again. He is a faithful husband. He's not forgetful. He doesn't betray. He is a faithful husband. And that should, you know, keep calm our spirits every night, knowing that the Lord will always be a faithful husband to his church. Even if the church is under persecution in America or in other parts of the world, the Lord will remain faithful. Because there's an agreement already. You see the agreement? Even in the, the, the Godhead, there is that agreement. God plans, the Lord executes, okay? And then um, the Holy Spirit applies the salvation. Okay, so let's keep moving. Keep moving. We, we are running really out of time. We only have about 12 minutes. And so the post-creation covenant is everything that happens after this covenant of cre this pre-creation covenant. You know, everything that happens is post-creation covenant. So obviously, there's so many. You know, the covenant of works, then the Abrahamic covenant. You know, and then the Mosaic, the Davidic, and all that. You know, that's post-creation covenant. So number two says the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. You know, there's two distinctions, right? The covenant of works, basically. Let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Oh, okay, sorry. So before I, I, I'm, so we're filling in the blank uh, here, filling out the blanks here in the study guide. So that's how that, I, for some reason I put that in the very bottom, but it should have been actually uh, more on top. But anyways, on top of the page. But if you look at the bottom of the page, so the Father, you know, if it's, you know, what would be easier to remember? You can do that three piece, you know which is basically, and there is, you know, scriptural background for that, scriptural support for that. So the father, what, the, what does he do? Plans. That's the first P. Plans. Number two, the son purchases. Okay? Um, basically, you know, he, he executes salvation for us. Ephesians 1, 7. And finally, the Holy Spirit, what does he do? Preserves. Okay? So you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit? That's Ephesians 1.13. So that you can fill in the blanks there for your study guide. Um, okay, so the covenant of redemption, covenant of works. Okay, so um, what is the covenant of works? This was the covenant prior to the fall in Genesis 3. So the covenant of works is the one that God, the, you know, God does with Adam pre-fall, okay? It emphasizes the testing period of Adam. The deal was that if Adam worked properly, then we would receive God's blessing, you know, as he is as the first Adam or representative. If he had obeyed, you know, we were with him there, by the way. So we, we sent with him in the fall. You know, but the agreement was, you know, if you work well, you will be blessed, you know. And more specifically, what was the, the sign of that covenant? It was that the tree, the tree, remember? If you eat from that fruit, you know, you will surely die. It wasn't, he didn't say you will die. He said you will surely die, okay? So that's important. The covenant of work is pre-fall, okay? Covenant of work, what is covenant of work? It's pre-fall, the agreement between Adam and, and, and God, God and, and, and Adam. Okay, um, any questions? 
before we move on to the covenant of grace. So the covenant of grace is basically what happens after the fall. Okay? And, uh, you know, you even see, um, you know, God operating. You know, God has always shown grace to the men, to men. Okay? Even prior to the fall, it was all, God has always shown grace. It's an act of grace to make Adam and Eve supervisors of his creation, right? Because they are the, the lesser vessel. Okay, so he's basically telling Adam and Eve, you're going to be image bearers of me, of my greatness. You're like a mirror, you know, when a mirror, you know, is hit by light, the, the, you know, the, the sunshine, you know, what happens? There's a reflection in, from that mirror that comes to the rest of the, the room, right? And so we are image bearers of God. We were supposed to show the world about God's greatness. And we're still commanded to do that now. You know, be the light and the soul of the, in the world. You know, we must shine. We must be salty. You know, if you're not salty, it's not good. <laughs> right? Because we must show to the world about this one God. God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost who work in harmony throughout history, even before history, you know, so the question is, how am I showing God to my neighbor? How are you showing God to your neighbor? You know, I, I go to the gym four times. You may think I go to the gym every day, but actually I just only go four times <laughs> a week, okay? Looks like I go longer, you know, more, right? But no, I actually, actually go four times. You can ask, uh, what's his name? Um... Uh, Stan, Stan um, Link, yes. He goes actually there every day, okay? So I go there only four, four times a week, and uh, there's this guy who's he's a veteran, okay? He served in the army. He's probably 10 years older than me. I mean, he's, he's buff. He's, he's a big guy, you know? But he, he's in his 50s, right? But he looks younger. But you can see his gray hair already showing up, right? And... Uh, you know, was, this is before I, I met him, and, and, you know, he would always, you know, he was always had this mean look, you know, it's like, ooh, he always looks like he's always mad. You know, so I was like, you know, hey, what's up? You know, every time I see him, you know, and then uh, he sent me a friend, a Facebook, re a friend request on Facebook out of the blue, right? Like, wait, who is this guy? Oh, I think him, I think he goes to my gym. So it's like, all right, I just, you know, he friend i accepted his friend request and uh and then he one time he told me hey i sent you a friend request he said he was pointing at me i sent you a friend request oh yeah i said he accepted it my name is pablo blah, 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 you know so i'm a pastor and and so now he calls me the preacher so every time i go to him hey what's up preacher you know but he doesn't say that in a, in a mean you know derogatory way i mean he just called me the preacher and one thing that really hit me Two days ago is when he, you know, we, we had conversations, you know. And you can tell that this man has seen a lot of things in war because he actually served. I think in, in, he, was, he, went, he, went, he was in Iraq um, um, back in the early 2000s, you know. Um, so anyways, um, he would post some like crude things on Facebook, right? And... Uh, and he told me something, but I, I noticed, like, he, he was, he's, he's being, smiling more. He's being more, um, you can see more peace in his face, right? I don't know if God, God is, has to be working. And he told me something when I saw him, like, two days ago. He said, hey, Pablo, man, I just, you know, I just, I just want to tell you something. It's that ever since I met you, I don't know, this is weird. And he said, please don't, don't take this the wrong way, he told me. I say, okay, man, don't worry, just, just hit me. Yes, what, what, what are you going to tell me? You know, every time I, 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 I met you, I just, I'm more careful on the things I post on Facebook. Like, why? Because I know you're a preacher. It's like, okay. And uh, what does that mean? You know, it's like, what, what do you mean? You know, it's like, I just, I just want to tell you that you're making me, you're helping me to be a better person. Hmm. That hit me because I'm not perfect, right? 
I just say hi to him. And you would think, you know, I, be, I need to be all over him to talk about God, right? And God is opening this door for me to, to share the gospel with him. And you can tell that he's, he's different. He's not the same person I, I, I met three months ago. And now every time I post something about scripture on my Facebook page, he always likes it. You know, it's the Holy Spirit working. It's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm a broken person too. <laughs> but why am I telling you this? Is that it's the grace of God, it's, it's, it's the work of God who softens the heart. He is his work. And I'm called to be an image bearer of him. You know? And uh, so now, man, the door is wide open for me to talk about Jesus with this man. He's a veteran. You know? And... Uh, Praise God that the door is opening, right? So those, why am I telling you this? Because we, we're, we have to be confronted with this question. How are we showing the heart of God to others? <laughs> and by the way, I wasn't really planning to, to do that. I wasn't in my mind, I'm, okay, I'm going to evangelize this one guy in the gym. The Lord is just using me for this particular person. And I, God is using you for other people. I know that because that's our calling to be a God's image bearers to the world who, 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 is, who are blind and lost. And so my prayer is that God will help us to understand that and be more proactive. I need to be more, more proactive about that. You know, this, what he said was like really hit me because it made me realize, man, Pablo, you have no idea about the power of God. The, the person that you expect the least to be more open to the gospel, the Lord can change the heart of a stone and change his heart or her heart. So the covenant of grace basically describes the relationship of God to his people sub subsequent to the man's fall into sin. After man became incapable of doing good works, now the fact that he's still standing is only by the grace of God, right? So after Adam and Eve broke the covenant, uh, you know, obviously, God, the, the fact that they were not exterminated at the very moment shows you the grace of God right there, even there. The fact that we breathe now <laughs> is an act of grace. <laughs> okay? The fact that we are alive, the fact that we can come to church Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings, evenings sometimes, is an act of God's grace. Because not many people have that freedom to come to church openly <laughs> in other parts of the world. So let's not take moments like this for granted. But let's be thankful. You know, Paul always says, be always thankful. Because God is gracious to us. Um, let's finish up the next three minutes. So that's the, the difference between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Um, you know, the covenant of grace, you know, is in technical terms, is pre, uh, is post fall, this after the fall of man, right? And then you will see the covenants that develop. You know, every covenant uh, after the fall. Uh, so praise God that God is not forgetful. Praise God that He showed grace to us. So the old covenant versus the new covenant. And basically says this. This is by O. Palmer Robertson, a quote from his book. is the bond of God with man before Christ may be called new covenant. Okay. Um, sorry, old covenant. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I misquoted that. Sorry, old covenant. The old covenant may be characterized as promise, as shadow, as prophecy, 
the new covenant may be characterized as fulfillment. So old covenant, you know, shadows, prefigures of Jesus. You know, the, if you read the book of Leviticus, you will see that all these, these terms, all these sacrifices, were, they, they were prefigures, shadows of, 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 a, of a greater sacrifice. Okay? And so, yes, thank you, Ronnie. Very good. Uh, so a correction to make in that um, quote is, be called the, the first sentence is the old covenant okay so the old covenant may be characterized as promise shadow and prophecy and the new covenant may be characterized as the fulfillment as a reality as a real realization you know the fulfillment jesus christ you know the perfect lamb you know when john says behold the lamb of god you know so basically basically john is saying you know here's a fulfillment He's, this is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He is our only hope. This is our remedy. You know, even like when you look at the book of Numbers, remember the, ser the bronze serpent, you know, that was, had to be held up so the people could find healing by looking at the serpent, right? It's a prefigure of Jesus, right? Being on the cross, nailed to the cross, you know. There's a remedy. when We must look at Jesus in order to be safe, in order to find restoration to our souls. You see? So... The, the Bible works, it's a unified story that points us to the new covenant, to the reality who is Jesus Christ himself. We don't have time, so um, we'll talk more about that next time. But let me show you one more video and then we're done. Uh, basically, it speaks about the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. This is a very short video. It's only two minutes. I think one answer to that would be to take what John says in his prologue. So here's the question. One answer to that would be to take what John says in his prologue, that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, what does John mean? Does he mean there was no grace in the Old Testament? Does he mean there's no law in the New Testament? Obviously not. He's making a relative contrast. This is I think this is John Murray. He's making a relative contrast in absolute terms. That there was so much law under the Old Testament that it, it appears as though the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, added laws relative to the state of Israel as a teenager, as an infant and a teenager. I, I, remember, I remember when I first allowed our children to be home alone. It was an emergency. My wife was at a Bible study somewhere. I was at home with the children. They were in their sort of early teens. And an emergency happened. I had to go to the hospital. I told my children 400 things they were not allowed to do until <laughs> mother comes home. But the number one thing was do not answer the door. Right? If somebody knocks on the door, do not open the door. Now, my children are in their 40s. I don't give them any laws at all, but I do expect them to, 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 to live in relative obedience uh, to some standards. But that's a, that, that's a way of, of saying that, that the old covenant was an administration for teenagers and the new covenant is an administration for adults. I'm just going to add that one thing is very important that took me years to understand. Um, that the Old Testament, in one sense, does not equal the Old Covenant. Uh, that the Old Covenant, properly speaking, technically speaking, is the Mosaic Covenant. That it is the, the law, as Derek was saying, as John makes clear in that prologue, and that's the distinction. We did an issue of Table Talk, uh, I don't know when it was, I get, get the years sort of, they all flow together. but. A few years ago, uh, I think it was called What's So New About the New Covenant? To really try to help people understand what is new about the New Covenant, what is unique, and also the continuity between the Old and New Covenant. So just a helpful point of, of clarification, uh, but, it, but it's important, important. Well, and it's, it's important to remember that our theologians have used uh, the word covenant to describe a lot of different relationships. So there's not only the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, but there's the, the broader framework in Scripture of the covenant of works that was given to Adam, 
uh, where he was to maintain his relationship to God with perfect obedience, uh, and then the covenant of grace, and both the old, what we call the old covenant and the new covenant are administrations of the covenant of grace. So the mosaic economy as an administration of the covenant of grace has a particularly legal cast, and part of the function of that, as Paul says over and over again, is to teach the reality of sin. Um, it's, it's difficult to keep all the law of Moses, and so it, it impinges on the people of God to know their sinfulness and to know their need of mercy. And it's the reason why Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5 speaks of the old covenant as an administration of death and the new covenant as an administration of glory. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a relative contrast in absolute terms. Um, but clearly one of the aspects of the old covenant was to reinforce our natural in, inherited depravity. So by maximizing the laws, it showed up sin. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's uh, close with prayer. And um, you know, praise God that we have in front of us salvation in Christ Jesus. You know, he's, he's the pinnacle. He's the the fulfillment of all these old covenant, uh, you know, administrations of all these promises. It's no more just promises, but it's actually the fulfillment itself. And we have him. You know, we can partake of the Lord's Supper, you know, once a, a month or some churches do it more often. But, uh, you know, that, that points us to the new covenant. When Jesus says, this is a new covenant in my blood, you know, man, we're, we're in the fulfillment of this. What a joy that we're in this part of redemptive history that we can enjoy this blessing of the fulfillment of these promises that many people in the past long to see we have it at hand what a joy what a blessing and you know may the lord use you to show his love to the world uh, to the broken world you know we must we must light shine in this community it's not optional we must you know we're called to to be god's ambassador we are god's ambassadors you know lord help us to do that and i'm i'm the the the, the, the you know as paul said i'm the the worst sinner you know and you know when i said that story to you about this guy in the gym you know i'm not i wasn't trying to say oh what a good christian i am no because i wasn't really intending to minister to him but yeah it just happened the Lord just opened the door. You know, it's God's work. Yeah, exactly. God's work, you know. But that, that called me to be more intentional, you know, when it comes to my relationship in the world, you know. Don't be like the world. Don't act like the world. By all means, don't, don't act like the world. But shine in the world, right? Show God's grace to the world. Let's pray.